Um, other than that, it's being recorded. At this minute, I your, your faces are not being recorded. So, so in other words, Goff, um, your famous words, let's get on with it. And, and before we actually let's get on with it, what do you know about the subject that we're going to be doing today, Pablo Benito? Sorry? Pablo Benito, that's where we're going to be looking at today. Shape okay. of the Canyon. Do you know anything about it? No. Right. Um, to start off on a very silly note, have you ever seen the Indiana Jones films? Yeah. You know, at the beginning of the um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, young Indiana goes off and um, um, gets an artifact off somebody from um, the landscape of New Mexico. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think I remember that. Yeah. yeah, so basically that scene, that scene is like based on the stuff that we're going to see, see now today. Um, and, and lots of, lots of the, the, the sense of the research about the Indiana Jones film, other than the last film, is, is based on a, a, a nice level of, of research. Like Tannis that we see in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, like the people of Chaco Canyon that we see in Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's all been nicely researched. And lots of people have come to archaeology because of the Indiana Jones films. I know it sounds silly, um, but, it, but it makes archaeology uh, very sexy. And what does make archaeology very sexy is a subject like this. And it's a subject like this, um, Pablo Benito, that, that we struggle as archaeologists to um, really get to the nitty and gritty with. You know, it's very difficult to understand what's going on with these people. But what we do know, if anyone wants to bring up the word the Anastasi, if, what, if anyone wants to um, um, look at um, and the number of other sites that we've got across this um, New Mexico landscape, um, it's almost a, there was a civilization, it was really going well a thousand years ago, um, 500 years ago, everything collapsed and everybody disappeared. And that disappearance is all related to climate, climatic changes caused by the people of that vast landscape of New Mexico. Um, and that vast landscape of New Mexico was once heavily wooded at one point. Um, and the peoples of that landscape cut down on all the trees. Um, they found that they had rich agriculture for some time. They found that they had plenty of water. And after a few hundred years went by, um, the climatic landscape collapsed and the people had nothing, and they had to move away from the landscape. So the subject that we're looking at today is very fitting, um, if you take away um, the pandemic, very fitting into what we were talking about before, climate. Climate, climate, and climate. That's what we were talking about before. Um, and if we could learn from this civilization, and it was a very civilized civilization, um, and their mistakes, it might be able to advise us on where we're going wrong today. But with many things with humanity, um, we don't seem to learn from our mistakes as humans. And we've got to start learning from the archaeology. This image itself, as, as we're looking at straight away, um, is an image of a subterranean world associated with the buildings at uh, Pablo Benito. And, and Pablo Benito, which is usually the wrong pronunciation, um, Pablo Benito itself refers to... Um, uh, the beautiful town or the beautiful people um, and um, and when we want to get into the nitty and gritty I, I just thought I would focus on just this one site of many similar sites throughout that landscape as you can see you've got sort of a subterranean world this timber itself was a timber that would have been, would have been felled about a thousand years ago and it was a black and white image and this timber still today supports this this structure all this stonework. And as you go down into the subterranean world, as the landscape was getting hotter and hotter with the felling of trees, these people were having to go underground. Um, like the people of Katal Hayek, when we look in Turkey and we look at the um, Neolithic period um, within that landscape there, lots of people as landscapes change due to a human interference, um, people have a habit of going underground. Now this, is a striking image. And the one thing you can actually see here, um, Goff, is a tree. And you can see Pablo Benito. Yep. This, is, this is a reconstruction of Pablo Benito. Um, but um, I would like to say that the reconstruction is not much of a leap of imagination from the archeology. span When we talk about leap of imagination from the archeology, span 
Lots of the walls at Pablo Benito are 10 to 15 meters high still after the site was abandoned probably about 600 years ago. We don't really know when the site was abandoned. Some say 700 years ago. But this site was abandoned a very long time ago in human consciousness. The way these people are building gives us an idea of technical innovation, techn technological prowess. And there's one image that I'm going to show you today that I'm really proud of. And it's, a sh it's an image that these people didn't need to use the arch as we had to use in the Western world. They needed to use the corner to give strength to their buildings. And when you see that image, I don't know if that's going to be after the break or before. So I don't know if you and I can have a chat about that image, Gov. But that image itself is fascinating. Two things other than the tree. And um, when I said they felled all trees, they left one tree standing, the great tree. And we've got a wonderful piece of dendrochronology associated with this tree. A such, such a wonderful piece of dendrochronology that the dendrochronology tell us of catastrophic environmental changes across the landscape. And we don't actually get that with my usual lectures or any lectures that archaeologists do, where we've actually got a book that we can actually look at. One minute at the beginning, you've got a rich, less landscape. At the end, you've got a com landscape completely devastated by human beings. Um, the other two things is that you've got the, the wonderful sense of linearship and the other sense of geometry, where you've got these subterranean buildings known as kivas, K-I-V-A, kivas. And these subterranean buildings are almost very similar to the Broch-like structures on Orkney and, and Shetland and northern Scotland. Well, when we say Broch-like stru structures, um, they, they were accessible, um, these ones in particular were accessible from above unlike the Brock-like structures, which are accessible from ground floor level. But the similarity is, is that the Brock-like structures that we see in Scotland uh, built some of them about the same time as this, we do believe were actually used as community centers. And all the buildings around the outside were where people lived, which is very similar to what we're seeing, very interestingly. Um, and again, back to the tree. These people mourned the loss of all their trees because it would be their undoing. Um, one thing that has to be massively said is that in pure contrast to these people, the pure contrast is those other Native Americans across the Native American landscape. And there were millions at one stage, be, one stage before our damnable ancestors wiped many millions out. And those people respected the tree and they only took from the woodland and the forest what they could take and they needed to take. These people were a different type of Native American. These took everything. And it was at it was at their um, it was at their sense of taking everything um, that everything would be taken eventually from them. Um, what we're talking about is is uh, turquoise. We're talking about the the natural occurring mineral turquoise, which was readily traded and readily mined within across their la vast landscape. It was one of their only major resources, and that there uh, is a head of a type of parrot that used to fly around their woodlands and forests. And as they slowly started to cut down the trees, these, these wonderful birds themselves um, eventually become extinct, as did the civilization. The, these people were beholden to these birds. And we know that they were beholden to these birds because we actually find complete, the parrot-like um, creatures like this, um, still preserved within the archeological layers. And we'll see a complete example and you know exactly the type of bird that we're actually talking about. Um, so we've got a bit of an archaeology overview. We've got a bit of an artifactual overview. And now we start to allow other things to speak to us. Now, um, when I actually did this lecture on um, Tuesday evening, um, I asked a question of somebody like you, Goff. And the question was, what you see in about the artifacts? And Goff, these artifacts date from about a thousand years ago. What do one, two, three, four, five, six artifacts tell you? What does that tell you of the overview of the civilization without reading the text? Goff. Well, I think it's quite sophisticated and artistic. Yes. Um, and resourceful. Three yeah. good words there. Three good words. And then we talk about the words at the top of daily life, subsistence, that's not really a fair word because these people were, um, you can't have a civilization based on subsistence. They eventually subsided off the landscape, 
survived and then there was a collapse of their civilization. Technology, their mining of turquoise, their trade was extensive. We know about their trade and what they were trading. They were trading this, um, this sub-precious mineral on the left there. Um, and that sub-precious mineral was being traded with other civilizations down in the south, the Maya civilization. We don't really talk about Central America enough, which is at my detriment, because there's so much we could actually say about it. But 1,200 miles south, where you've got the belts of those cocoa trees, these, the people in the south are trading the cocoa, and these people are trading the turquoise. And this is when we get to the likes of Pakal at Palenque, uh, where, we see, um, where we see a similar um, a resource used in the sense of the jade mask, similar color, a similar type of resource. Um, and they love the color green, like the, all the civilizations there, and they love the color red as well. So with those trading links, the people in the south are trading cocoa with the people of the north, and the people of the north are trading um, these green-like minerals, the turquoise, to the people of the south. Communication was very strong. These people were very much reliant upon um, trading with shells as well. Um, and you think about all these wonderful things, and you think about these people, you think about their technology. And that thing on the right there, I've seen invariably described as a form of lamp. Uh, but it could e equally be performed as uh, like one of those spoons that you'd get in, a, um, in an oriental crockery, crockery set from um, a Chinese restaurant, which you would use to eat your, um, um, your, your soup. Um, so very sophisticated, they're quite a monochrome type of pottery. This type of monochrome pottery is a type of monochrome pottery seen with the Inca civilization, the Aztec civilization, throughout this entire land of understanding these civilized worlds. Moving on to my next very interesting image. But actually, taking things apart, I've got to chuck this one in there. And I've got to chuck this image in there. And the reason why I chuck this image in there, this is not an image of the people of Pablo Benito. This is an image of people before, thousands of years before. People who, who had a connection with the landscape. These people who had a connection with the landscape, treated it with great respect. They kept the trees around them. And they also had um, th these various um, goat-like um, features, uh, goat-like goat, goat creatures. Um, and they liked to draw this sort of rock art um, within their landscape. And this is very similar to San art, which you would see associated with South America. The, this is similar to the spirals um, that we would get in our own prehistory, very similar to North America and elsewhere. So what we've got, we've got people within, living within a civilized sense within the landscape, and then the later sense of civilized landscape where they cut down the trees. I've used the word civilized to describe people before the people of Pablo Benito and the people of Pablo Benito. The reason why I use that is that the word civilized can be... Um, a word that's um, used in the wrong way. People of North America at this time who kept with their trees are civilized because they learned to respect their landscape. These people are civilized because they're able to build with stone and mortar, but they got levels of civilization that are rather in contrast with each other. So what we can see um, is if we, if we look here, you've got New Mexico, Arizona, Across this entire belt, um, showing on the map on the left there, I know Ellen likes her maps, showing, showing here, showing the quadrant of the four states, Colorado, uh, Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, um, a, a vast landscape. And this vast landscape was populated by these people who had um, these sites like Pablo Benito and the um, cliff dwelling peoples as well. Um, which we will look at in the near future. We won't look at them today. And when we, when we, when we see that image, you'll know exactly the people that I'm talking about. Um, um, Pablo Benito, and a first image of this showing, just squinting your eyes. Um, Chris, I know you're at the back of the room, but I don't care if you can't see the image at the left. Um, you can actually see that the walls here are standing over 10 meters in height. And that is rather interesting. And it's rather interesting because it tells you of the architectural level that these people managed to get, that their archaeological ruins are still standing today. 
I don't know if any of you are in love with a place which I've visited many times, Cyprus, but when you go to places like Farm Augusta and parts of Nicosia, what you do see is buildings that were abandoned in 1974, 1975, due to the war between the north and south of Cyprus. Those buildings are all falling apart now because they've never been reoccupied. They were abandoned uh, because there's still that sort of zone between the two. Um, and those buildings are collapsing today, built with modern techniques. The buildings at Pablo Benito, in some parts are still standing, all the rooms completely intact. It might not show it from this image, image completely, but these people knew how to build. They knew what the linear line was. They, they knew what geometry was. And they knew that um, they had to integrate with the rock around them. And what do we mean by that? Let's just chuck that away a moment. So what you've got, you've got a vast civilization. And suddenly, if any of you know anything about the Anastasi, uh, the Anastasi people, they just abandoned the landscape. Like these people abandoned the landscape because they are exhausted. Don't you argue with me, any of you, that um, it was because of natural climatic change um, that um, these people abandoned the landscape. Don't you argue anything else? Because the fact of the matter is, the archeological proof tells you that these are the people who destroyed their own environment, like modern day civilization is doing today. Um, and I'm actually starting to feel angry at this minute because um, I'm looking at the civilization and I'm saying, I'm seeing you absolutely foolish, stupid human beings. How stupid are human beings throughout history in doing what you did to your beautiful landscape when you could have lived in unison with it and equally been a civilized. And you've all seen this image before, a mystery until the end of the lecture. The fact of the matter is you won't be visiting uh, these structures today because this is another lecture. Um, um, but when we do visit these people, um, you will also see similarities. Um, these are based in another valley um, a few miles north of Chaco Canyon. Um, and when we actually get to Pablo Benito as well, there's so much written about it. Um, and if you can sort of quickly skim over that, it's got my interpretation. In the later stages of Pablo Benito, women, the women, women had become subservient to men. But in the earlier stages of Pablo Benito, women were far more superior to men which again, it's another indication where you get civilizations, um, where you get women that um, are more important in civilization than men, and then the men take over and all these sort of, of strands of civilization. Typical with Central America as well, where you get the Olmec civilization, um, Zapotec civilization where, civilization, where you get women being in the um, primary role, and then you get the men in the subservient role, and then it changes around. So as you're looking down at the ruins of Pablo Benito, you have to get your eyes used to this, right? And as you, as you stream into your eyes, this image was taken in 2014. As you look into it, those black shadows are actually shadows created by the masonry still standing today. Now that is rather important. And what is rather important is what I said earlier on. And what I said earlier on is that these, that these people, um, tried to have an integration, an appreciation of their natural landscape. And what we're talking about is that stone there, that, that cliff face um, at one time collapsed. And when that collapsed was um, over the past hundred or so years, the people who built Pablo Benito built it very near the cliff line. And when they built it very near the cliff line, the rock was very different. There was moisture, the moisture um, in the beds was keeping the rock integral um, so it wouldn't collapse. But as time went by, as moisture went from the valley, the rock started to dry out. And, and probably over 100 years ago, the rock face collapsed and destroyed parts of the ruins of Pablo Benito that had been standing quite nicely for hundreds and hundreds of years. So what we're saying is these people knew, um, knew and understood the rock as well and how the rock stood and that the rock will stay there as long um, as there's this interaction with moisture and understanding between human beings and the natural environment. Now, these things here, um, these are known as kivas. These circular, and lots of these kivas are accessible only from above. This large kiva is accessible from above and on ground level. Um, and what we find with these kivas, as we'll see with a later plan, is lots of them show 
um, that there's no signs of any halves in them, which would, and some have do, do have halves in them, but one or two show that um, there's no halves in them, indicating that they're not places that people lived. They're places that people met. How many people uh, lived at this uh, wonderful site? The, the answer is, um, was there hundreds? Um, was it built over a period of time in stages? The, the answer is, is that we don't really know um, how people are interacting with these buildings and how many people lived here. But how, however many people lived here, there were many more of these structures littered across the New Mexico, the Colorado and the Utah landscapes. And I tell you what, for archaeology, let's take Goth's words. How would you, uh, buildings that um, were constructed a thousand years ago, um, tiny bit of restoration on the top bits of the wall, but as archaeology goes, what's the word you, you would give for these ruins, Goth? I, I don't know what you mean. Well, how would you describe them? Would you say they were beautiful? Would you say they were impressive? Well, yes. Of course, yeah. They, they are Impre interesting. Interesting. Interesting and impressive. You know, th those, are, those are very useful words. Um, interesting and impressive. Um, and everybody, everybody, there's a sense of a wow factor that these, these remains have actually survived. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, looking at these ruins, it's... Um, and <coughs> Jane, Jane's just joined us. Um, again, looking at these ruins... Um, you can see um, several different layers, um, and it's believed that at, at its height um, of use, um, there were up to five floors within these structures. Five floors. These, these were the multi-story buildings of the civilized world in the past. Um, and interestingly enough, these things here are not windows, they're doors. Um, because if you're thinking all these buildings that are in close proximation to each other, there's no corridors, there's no streets between them. Um, that basically means that the on only way light could get into the lower levels of these buildings was, was actually lamps, um, because there was no windows in these. Uh, these are actually doorways leading between all the integral little rooms. And then you start to think about the beams. Um, and the wood associated with these structures, which we'll have a look, little look at a little bit more detail. Um, when you're actually doing research for lectures like these, you're, you're always reminded of the um, inadequacies of some of the material that I'm up against. And when I say inadequacies, the usual thing is, is that what, like last week, when we looked at the archaeology of the Teutonberg Forest, every illustration showed um, a mistake in their reconstructing the events of Teutonberg Forest. None of those images showed um, Roman soldiers were, were, were tightly placed as they were walking into the Teutonberg Forest. They didn't show that um, the Germanic tribesmen were fighting them from behind trees. Um, it didn't show any of this last week. And this week, we've got the same thing, where what, what they're saying, right, a, a little structure started here. Um, it doesn't show any trees, which it would have been. It was heavily wooded. It doesn't show a flowing river in the, in the backdrop. In other words, this sort of reconstruction of the landscape is completely wrong. Um, and then you get this sort of reconstruction of how the settlement was like um, a thousand years ago with the last remaining tree. This is more like it. Um, and as they start to develop Pueblo Benito, you start to get into more of a classical stage where these people uh, are starting to get into high culture. And lots of these buildings were, were very similar, again, to some of the buildings of ancient Egypt. But ancient Egypt was thousands of years before that. When we talk about the typical buildings in ancient Egypt, in the very hot sun of each ancient Egypt, um, it's not good to have windows. The best thing is to have just basically an entrance from the roof um, and to actually climb down um, via a ladder into the lower echelons of the building, um, to have lanterns and so on, to have fires in the buildings, this is the way those buildings were built. And naturally, you, you would have to build more stories on these structures as time went by, not to accommodate the people, but to um, act against soaring temperatures that was, that was occurring due to the dewoodestation de of the landscape. Now, some more of these trade goods. Um, 
some more of the natural um, mined turquoise, um, which they're which they're trading um, as they're trading as beads to people in the south. Uh, the, this this was their wealth. These these beads was actually the civilization's wealth. Um, and when I say the civilization's wealth, because this this is what they traded, as we say, uh, with the pe people of the Mayan. Um, and later Aztec kingdoms. And what you can actually see is they're, they're actually trading with the coast um, for various um, different um, mollusk um, shells. Um, and interestingly enough, we've got a beaker here that is something very similar to something that you would buy in the 1960s or 70s, where you'd get, where you'd get a glass beaker and people would little, put little beads on the outside, right? So this is a, a terracotta vessel um, and just before they fired it, they, they put all these little in, inserts of all these little stones on the outside. Very similar to something that you'd still find today in, in, in an antique shop. And it's one thing is actually said, and, I'm, and um, so I don't actually forget this. One thing that is clearly said is that um, these people um, are actually buried in the houses that they live in. So what happens is that um, like many other civilizations like the Inca, the Aztec, um, actually the Mayan, um, what, when people would die, um, the family would actually bury them, bury you in, in, in your home underneath the floor levels. Um, and what we do find in one or two buildings, we find quite a number of people buried within that building over several generations. And those people are buried with lots and lots of these little beads. And it is basically a bit of a status symbol. Um, and again, looking down at this wonderful site. Um, if everybody could bear with me a minute, I've just got to, I've just got to deal with um, a power problem with my computer a minute. So I'm just going to um, do something a minute. I think that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. I, I resolved it. Wonderful image. As you look down, directly down, down into the archeology, span um, you can get an idea of the gravity of this site. It's brilliant, having, it's brilliant having aerial views of archaeological sites like this. And if you start to look over, you can actually see that you've got these different floors. You can actually see the sense of these subterranean kivas. And these ones don't actually have doorways into them because they're accessible from above. Um, and there, around there on the image, would have actually been the great tree. Um, so, and if trying to sort of paint the landscape, I found, a little, I found a little tool um, last week associated with this. Um, and it's um, my little toolbar that we're gonna actually be using in a minute. So if you wanna understand um, where people are actually living, um, people are actually living in these, these areas here where the red arrow is. The kivas themselves are where people are actually having their possible communal meetings. It is, also, it is also stated that some of these could actually be used as actually storage silos for grain. Um, and they're not just um, meeting places. Um, it could be said as well that the preservation of some of these buildings, two or three stories are still completely intact within some um, of these structures. The other thing as well is these open places are likely to be the places um, that people would have all sort of had mass meetings, probably late in the evenings. Um, and where is the water stored? Well, you might also um, like to think that some of these um, so-called kivas might actually be water storage silos. So, you know, this had everything. But one thing that this thing didn't need, this wall is not a defensive wall. The wall around the outside is not defensive. This is, this is an engineering feature, not a defensive feature. And how do we know that? Well, when we actually go a little bit further into the lecture and we look at a few of the slides, these are actually, these here, hang on a minute, hang on, if we can do, the, into the wall, uh, move that one around, there are actually little doorways leading directly into the wall on the outside. So that would basically mean that that's not a defensive wall. So all these, important, all these important features help us understand the landscape. Are trees starting to return? No, uh, these are all shrubs. So we'll clear them, move on to the next image. 
and back over to my mouse. Now, when we talk about tree rings, this is when Zoom as a medium for teaching comes into its own because we're going to do exactly what we did with a plan. Now, if you look at these tree rings, all these tree rings here, you can actually see that um, there's a few millimeters between each tree growth ring, and you can clearly see that. Now, it's very likely that if we, if we um, look at around here, the growth rings start to get more tighter. And the reason is, it's at this point that over 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, that the people of Pueblo Benito have actually started felling the trees. And that means that the growth rings in this area are lacking moisture from the ground. And that's all being caused to the deforestation, the dewoodestation of the vast landscape around. Um, and this is a wonderful vessel of understanding the past. Um, and, you know, last night when we had the lecture on trees, um, you know, I, I should have probably made more about um, the trees telling us about environmental change. Um, but I didn't have a sample of those trees to look at. This is a sample of that great tree. Um, and this tells us everything. Um, and, and more or less, as you start to get to the outer echelons of the tree here, um, the, the tree rings get so, so tight, they're very difficult to record. So Goff, um, do, you see the, do you see the importance that I'm, I'm placing onto um, this sample of tree or isn't that well-founded? Yes, yes, yes. I get it. The, and, and it should be that people should be getting um, that we need to learn from what we're seeing. Um, and it's Pueblo Benito, um, as, I, as I say, when I, when I started doing this lecture, preparing this lecture, I did get very angry. Um, the other thing I can get very angry with about Pueblo Benito um, is that when the site was originally founded 1849 by um, an American um, lieutenant who was exploring throughout the landscape 1849, um, he just recorded it. Um, and in 1904, another archaeologist antiquarian came in, started digging out Pueblo Benito. And when he started digging out Pueblo Benito, all the artifacts he was selling um, onto tourists who were coming into the valley. And the US government said, right, you've got to stop your archaeological excavation. So he stopped. But he had, he had buildings full of artifacts that he was selling on. And it's a bit of a shame that, because those artifacts that he, that he was selling on were actually those artifacts that could have told you about the trading links. And it was only until 2009 the pottery, very similar to this, because these are reconstructed examples, pottery from 2009, they actually started to analyze uh, the, the um, mineral traces on the, the inside of the beakers that they were finding, very similar to this in 2009. And they actually finally found out that the people in North America were trading with people in South America because there were traces of cocoa. Now, I don't know if you've been on holiday to Central America, but I'm told, Goff, that they, they, they do a traditional drink in Central America. It's a very bitter drink of cocoa. That if you want to sweeten it, you add a bit of honey to it. And obviously that very, very bitter sweetened cocoa eventually mutates into our modern day chocolate or a modern day hot chocolate. But then again, our modern day hot chocolate is not very different from the drink that they're drinking back then min, min, in a mineral, mineral sense, except we add a lot of sugar to it today. Um, so it's a shame we've lost our archeological evidence, but now we're starting to actually really fulfill our understanding of the landscape. And 
as we're looking down here, um, we're looking at the wasteland. And there's no way that they could have built this without timber. And they used a lot of timber because every single floor, there's evidence of very thick timbers being used. And as you start to get further and further up into the buildings, the timber gets thinner and thinner and thinner because what's happening, they've got rid of all the big trees to build um, this, this wonderful um, set of structures. Um, and then you're left with the smaller trees to actually complete the structures. And you can actually see what's happened here. Um, it's very likely that the damage actually caused over a hundred years ago with this rock face collapsing were actually some of the finest remains at Pueblo Benito, but they were lost. Pueblo Benito uh, within um, the Chaco Canyon. Many, many publications have actually been written about it. And this is rather interesting. Uh, the photograph was actually taken with the cliff still intact. But what the archaeologists did was to do a reconstructed drawing um, of how the remains looked a little bit later. Um, so there you go. Now, let's go into a little bit of a lesson. Um, obviously, you know a little bit about engineering, Goff, and I know you do. Um, but as I've said, there are no windows in these structures um, that we can really discern. So in other words, what are these things? Any ideas? What are these? Any ideas? Are they uh, for climbing up the wall or something? Close. These are putt logs. All right. These, these are for scaffolding. So, so right. what, what you do as you're building these, um, you're obviously removing um, timber from the landscape to actually um, use a scaffolding so you get to the next level. So you put some planks. Um, then obviously you're putting the beams in for the building and then you go to the next level. Um, um, more, more scaffolding, more beams, more scaffolding, more beams. And then eventually, after they've got to the full height of the structures, uh, which are in the, in the internal walls themselves, are supporting uh, all the other walls and so on, uh, but there's, there's another innovation which I'll show you in this amazing slide that I'm going to show you. Um, but the, eventually, these, the timbers are removed. And what they do, they put um, um, mortar in there. Um, technical term, a putt in there. Um, giving its name, a putt log. Um, and I know Rosamond's listening to this now. And she will be aware uh, at um, Dennis Powers Castle that she's currently visited. There are lots of these holes there, and they're not little windows, they're little scaffolding poles. Clear drawing. Okay, back to mouse. And this landscape has been then eventually in 1920, 1927, uh, the landscape of Pablo Benito was extensively excavated. And when within this wonderful plaque that's on site, it said the expedition uh, removed 100,000 tons of rubble and windblown sand accumulated over the centuries. They accurately recorded, um, uh, it should say, they accurately recorded and reconstructed parts of the uh, destroyed walls to match the ancient, ancient masonry. And some of those parts that were destroyed are parts that were destroyed because of that relatively fresh cliff fall at the time. So what we're going to do, we're going to go off the images um, in a short while and we're going to stop the screen sharing um, and I'm going to go to some of my notes. But before we actually do that, what we do, we, we, we find some hefty stones for grinding in the site as well. This is known as Gambler's Alley. Um, somebody reckoned that, um, one archaeologist reckoned that the little hole in there, uh, they had a, a form of gambling. Um, and obviously the one to get the... Um, the, the, the grain or the one to get the uh, turquoise bead directly in the middle would win the game. I don't know if that's archaeologists smoking smoke newsprint. But as we're getting into closer into these walls, 
um, they were actually rendered on the inside and rendered on the outside because the walls were put together with a form of mortar. And that in turn would have kept the mortar seeping out the walls if there was a gush of rain and then giving some great integrity to the overall structure um, of these buildings. And again, giving you a sense, most of the, most of the structures within Colorado, Utah, Arizona, um, and the likes of New Mexico are associated in a variety of different valleys. But there are three particular valleys that are of importance. Canyon, De Shelley, uh, Pablo um, Benito um, in Chaco Canyon, and Mesa Verde. And Mesa Verde is where we will go again. Uh, that's, that's the cliffside one. And we'll look at more of the disappearance precisely of Anastasi with that lecture. And a little bit of art. And you know what? I'm going to pick on Goff again. That's a bit of, um, that's a bit of terracotta. Um, that's a bit of their fired pottery. Um, and there's a specific thing I'm looking for on that. Um, and see if you can spot it. What, what am I looking for when I'm looking for interesting archaeological evidence from that to tell you how the people were? Goff. I'm not sure I know. Yeah. Actually, actually, if I said the Picts, right, um, with Pictish um, carvings um, and Pictish designs on rocks, Goff, um, you don't actually see them having pictograms on, on their faces. It doesn't actually show oh. that, yeah, it doesn't actually show that the Picts have painted faces. It's a word given for the Romans that they give to the Picts, but we don't actually have any carved evidence for it. We don't have any evidence from the Picts that they were actually painted, they had painted faces at all. But what I was looking for was that these people did tattoo their faces because yeah. you can see actually tattoos on their pottery. Yes. Yes, let's do that. Yeah. Do you, do you know when we, do you know, um, you know, if anyone said, right, Carl, you could actually just be imagining maybe they didn't have tattoos. And I could then argue, well, you know, when you show me a photograph, how do I know that photograph hasn't been doctored? So you've got to have a little bit of a leap of faith. I've got to be honest with you. But a human head of, of an effigy, and you get, get an idea how these people looked. Um, we, we know, we, we try to get so close to them. Um, because we've got so much of their archaeology has been abandoned. At Mesa Verde, for example, um, what we do see is that whole buildings are completely abandoned, where we see the ladders from the roof still going into the buildings, where we see bowls with food in them still, um, and we see chairs knocked over and various different things, completely abandoned and they disappeared, right? And this is not not exactly similar to Pablo Benito, but the evidence tells us that something dramatic did happen for the people to have abandoned the site in the first place. We don't get archaeology like this in the Western world because people in the Western world, we have one city abandoned and then you get another town established over here and they nick everything, right? What's happening with this landscape um, is that the people left behind um, are the Apache people. Um, and the people, um, though, those people learn to live within their um, environment, for example. Um, and they've always lived within their environment because they understand their environment. And do you know what they do? They abandon these, they, they, they not only see these sites as, as abandoned, but they abandon these sites. They say, well, it didn't do them any good, did it? It didn't do them any good to have five-story buildings. It didn't do them any good to cut down all the trees. We're just going to leave it. And people are surprised when I talk about whole buildings being left with everything in them and nobody ever going back to them. But if you go to the island of Lewis in the Hebridean Islands, you get whole homes that have been abandoned on the island of Lewis from only 50, 60 years ago. And you can see tinder beans just open, left on the table. Um, and people just abandoned these buildings and nobody's ever been there since. So this isn't, we are not people who go out looting things in every single situation. Um, and there's so much to be learned about different tiers of how human consciousness thinks. And those little tiers and tiers of the people themselves are to be exacted in the archaeology that we're seeing. 
Now, rather interesting plan here, and I'm going to get to my little bit of a drawing, uh, and we're going to turn to red. So um, you obviously got the idea of the plan in your minds now. Uh, the, these larger buildings here, these kivas, community centres, maybe one or two of these are store, um, storage pits, for example. Um, and it's actually, it's actually given you more of a description as well if we look at a little bit of the plan. So it's saying that there are ovens in some of the buildings um, and it's showing as well that the heating pits are in here, 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 and you know the type of thing I'm getting at here. And very few, and there's the, in fact very little evidence of any heating pits in these circular structures. And before anyone asks, why do we think they're community centres? Probably for that very reason that if if they're if they're homes you've got to assume that people are heating themselves, particularly in the very cold nights and winter months. Um, and when you think about it, few facts I've missed is that this site is over three acres in area. Um, it's around the size of the thumbprint of the Millennium Stadium. This is how big this sort of site is. Um, three acres in area, so it's quite a large, large place. And it's all built up. Um, Moving on again, mouse, and look at that. Um, now, rather interesting, a few clues to where we're going to go. Um, this, is, is, this is that sort of external wall bit. You can actually see a, a doorway going directly outside. Um, but there's a little bit of an architectural feature that I want to share with you. Uh, is that within their lower layers, um, they're using, um, not showing here, but in another illustration, they're using timber, and in lots of cases, really thick timber. Um, and then in the <laughs> upper levels, they're almost resting um, the timber on um, corbelin that juts out, because they don't really have the thick beams to put into the walls anymore. Again, that's seen in the tree rings, and that's seen in more of the archaeology. This is a reconstructed section that was destroyed in that collapse over 100 years ago. But looking at this, this is almost as if it's a ship in the desert. Um, and it's almost as if you're looking at something from ancient Rome um, or the very ancient Egypt. It's almost as if you're looking at one of those abandoned villages in Cyprus. I have seen some of those abandoned villages in Cyprus and they look like this. But this isn't 50 years old. This is a thousand years old. Um, and it's all mortar built. Um, all the mortars just obviously flecked and sort of fallen off the walls. How do we know that they use mortar? Well, that evidence is coming. This is all brush around here now. And um, somebody said in one of my, um, somebody said in my, in my class on Monday, they said, oh, why, why didn't they just plant trees again? And I said, do you really understand? Do you really understand that you can't just plant trees? When something like the Amazon, Amazon rainforest is gone and you've agriculturally exhausted the soil, you can't grow trees there anymore. This is what's happened to this landscape. Like our ugly, horrible Snowdonia and our ugly, horrible um, Brecon beacons where there are no trees. I, I detest that landscape uh, because humans exhausted that landscape. And in most places, you're never, ever going to return trees. These people should have known better. These people were descendant from those people who drew the pictograms, but they hadn't learned and they hadn't understood what they were getting into. More of that evidence as we actually look down um, into these structures and a, a clue to their, their usage in one or two cases, is this stone bench. Um, and let's sort of get the, um, let's get that in there. So we can actually, um, boop. you can actually see the stone benches in there, coming in there, all these little stone benches. And you can't see 
Um, you can't see any doorways into this one. And you can't see any doorways into this one or this one because they're accessible from above. Okay, mouse again. Now, uh, this, is the, this is an image that we're going to discuss. Um, and the reason why we're going to discuss it is architecture. And from an architectural point of view, these doorways, hang on, doorway, doorway, and you've got another doorway here. All of these doorways are completely lined up. So that uh, they're completely lined up and it's nothing to do with sun of solstice and all that absolute nonsense and rubbish that people talk about from the uh, prehistoric period. This, this, is, this is nothing to do with alignment. This is just basically access on the lowest levels. Um, and I showed, I mentioned earlier on that for example, what we do have is mortar on the walls. They actually, they, these, these would have been colorful walls. And we know that they actually used, um, they knew, we know that they use lanterns uh, because we've actually got the evidence of lanterns. Um, albeit we got the evidence of oils that they used. So, you know, that would have had to have been brought into the site. Another thing that I wanted to mention, which, which I've alluded to as well, is this. Now, these are very hefty beams from trees that would have been, the, to get you timber like that, the trees would have been at least about 50 odd years old. Um, using whole trunks to actually be used as beams in these structures, which would give, give the buildings a sense of structural stability. And then what we do find then is that to give the buildings another central a sense of structural stability, you have these beams. So in other words, you've got a cross lattice formation within these structures where you've got, um, if anyone knows anything about uh, structurally, uh, these, these walls are on um, this side, these are known as the um, eave walls, um, and these ones are known as the gable walls. Too many arrows. So what you would do to keep, so you'd have the heavy structures running, running from eave wall to eave wall, and you'd have the thinner ones um, leading from gable wall to gable wall, the bay walls in other words, um, and they, they, that would create a cross lattice um, infrastructure for the buildings. But these were inevitably um, much more um, thinner. Um, they weren't using really hefty timbers and that could be to do with the um, deep sense of deforestation. And also as a final thing, before anyone gets completely zonked with the amount of arrows on here, um, these, these are, this is the corbelin. Um, so what's probably happening is that um, maybe there's a few structural changes. Um, this, may have been, this may have been phase one, um, and as they're going up, um, they're thinking, right, you know, we, we need to sort of put some, a few more lighter beams across this. They've got to be really thin instead of resting on the beams below. So we've got a few structural oddities there. Um, and if anyone wants to know, this is sandstone they're actually building, that they're actually using and building with. Um, but again, back to the alignment, you can actually see um, as an architectural term that these walls are flush right, that these walls are flush. If you put a ruler along, along these walls, right, um, it would be level. Um, and as you're looking through, it's, it's almost as if these are perfectly aligned. Um, and trying to gauge the, the perfect sense of alignment is to basically look at the spacing that you can see as you start to go through all the different rooms. And that, again, is engineering at its finest. Um, were we building structures like this in medieval Europe? Uh, the answer is, in some places, yes. In other places, no. Um, when the Spanish got to uh, the lower echelons of New Mexico, um, by about the late 1500s, 1600s, um, they were not building structures like this. This is far superior to Spanish building. Um, after these buildings were being deserted and abandoned. Um, rather interesting. Um, I've got no answers for this, but in one or two buildings, we find little niches like this. What were the little niches for? Um, and they're quite high up, really. Now, 
I'm, I'm, I'm sniffing newsprint, but um, these people have got um, reverence for their loved ones who are actually buried underneath the floor. And I'm thinking maybe they may have mummified one or two of their loved ones and put them in the higher niches to overlook the room. I'm not saying that that's, I'm not saying that that's anything that they did, but the Inca did that and other Central American civilizations did that as well. So maybe, or maybe I'm completely wrong. But the other thing as well is, is finally, as we look at this illustration, you can, start, you can still see some of the original timbers that were actually used back in the day. Um, and it's these timbers that we can, that archaeologists can learn a little bit from still. Uh, and somebody said, my drawing skills are not brilliant. Oh, I would agree. Um, so, do you want me to pick on you again, Goff, or do you want me to spit it out? No, go ahead. All right then. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll do both. What's the unusual thing about this? These three images. Oh, ah, let me see. Well, they're all, they're all obviously all different shapes and colours. So you know, there's no sort of common continuity to them. Well, what, what, what? I use the word technology. <laughs> Come on. They, they, they're utensils, aren't they? You, you were. Uh, you are not going in the right direction, but that is a uten that that one there uh, is a utensil. So you got that right. That's utilitarian to keep people are wearing it. But the one that is odd with this is actually this. Now you would think, would you not, that this civilization um, is, you know, is a thousand years ago? You would have thought that if they're producing brilliant pottery like this and they had beautiful ornamentation like this, that they would no longer need to use arrows like this. But they were still using this form of technology to hunt. It's obsidian. But then again, obsidian is being used across all the Americas. There's very little iron in the Americas. There's, there's, there's evidence of copper, uh, there's gold, and there's silver. And there's, you know, there's semi-precious stones like, um, turquoise but the, the fact of the matter is is that they're still using this technology so you've got a high civilization but they're using early technology but what i've got to say is why not use something like this keep using the technology because um you know if obsidian does the job keep using it i say so what we're going to do we're going to we're going to take a break uh we're going to put the mics on um and we're gonna um stop sharing um and if nobody wants their face seen um then they need to turn off the camera now so we're gonna we're gonna basically um un unmute you all um uh, and anyone would like to say anything whilst uh, just before the break and i tell you what that, that beautiful image that i've actually got behind me um carl. Came, came from peter in in barry carl um on some of the images you showed earlier, it looked as though the the actual structure was built in two halves. Yes. And on one of the plans, there's one of the kivas going over the central wall. It looks as though it's been built later. Is that true? Or... Do, you know, do you know what we can do with that? We can we're going to go back to that image. Um, and and one thing one thing that you have said is is very right. I haven't really concentrated on that. So basically, this is the one you were talking about. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So um, if we can, if we can get in my little bit of art again, my annotation. Um, so here we go. So it's al it's almost as if um, what we do have, we, we have this built in a number of different stages. Um, so at some stage, uh, it might be that um, it might be that this is all built. Um, uh, as one or maybe at another stage excuse my drawing that's built first and then it's added together um but you are right that seems to swap over into the other side so yeah. this is all to do with phasing um, and there is one quite stark thing is that there's more kivas on the right hand side than there is on the left 
Um, and my master's degree was actually in archaeological access analysis, which basically means the ability of access into places. Um, and, and whenever you've got thresholds, um, it's always a sense of control. Um, so by having access of doors into some buildings, um, you've obviously got a sense of openness. To have access from above and no doors from the side, you've got a sense of control. Um, and th there's a lot of that when you look at that. Would you like to say anything more or we, um, anything else? No, it's just on, on a, a, one of the images you showed about the early settlement, the, the sort of tree that, or whatever it was, the last remaining tree was actually outside the settlement on the left, I think. So Hang on, we're going to do that now. We're going to do that. You're, sh you're seeing that. That's, fa that's, phase, that's phase one or phase two. So obviously what they're doing, they're, there we are. That's they're, it. Yeah. they're eventually extending um, the settlement. Now, it's rather interesting that the tree of life is outside the, the main initial stages of building. Um, but then again, they encompass the tree and the tree survives and witnesses yeah. um, at least the major 300 stages of development of the site. Um, and obviously, it's decline. Thank so, you. <laughs> no, Carl. it's fine. It's OK, Carl. Keith, go for it. A um, couple of questions. Have we found any refuse pits so we know what the diet was basically of them for most of the time? And second, I haven't seen any staircases. Do they have stairs? Right, they, they would, from, from, Murder, um, from Mesa Verde, we, we have the sense that they actually had access from the roof and there, there is ladders. So we know that the civilizations within the landscape had ladders. There's no evidence of stairs. Now, you, you're going to send me off on a tangent in a second, so I'm going to keep this point brief. Stairs is a technical innovation, and I keep saying that, like fireplaces in the Western world. But that's, that's a Western technical innovation, not, not an American innovation. We do have stairs when we look at Incan civilization and um, Aztec civilization, but they didn't need stairs. They, they, ladders um, did the job, and doorway access into various levels um, of these structures. And the other point with refuse pits, um because i allowed my brain to think a little bit more there um they have found refuge pits but they've also found that um there's a sense of status involved in the refuge pits in in the evidence that they found but i don't think they've done enough research on the refuge pits because lots of the archaeology on the site was done in the 1920s and they weren't really interested in refuge pits so that leads us with a problem not really being able to answer your question um, any, any, any other can questions? I, can, I, can I ask, were they living in sort of shared communities where they, you know, they had the cooking facilities centrally um, and shared those or were they living more separately within that, that greater wall? Um, the, 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 pro the problem is, um, if, if I did my access analysis on that structure to try and work out the links of uh, power and control um, and how people are moving around the buildings within thresholds and so on and so on, it, it would be practically in, it'd be a year-long task to work that out. And it's oh. a year-long answer. Um, because, because we've got multi-story structures, um, you can't use the analogy when you look at Rome. Rome itself in about 400 years AD had a million people living um, there and they had multi-story buildings. Um, you had tier upon tier upon tier and some of those have survived. And we have written accounts of who was living in those buildings. But with something like this, is very difficult to interpret because what's happening is, as a building collapses, it all collapses in and it all mixes up as one. So to try and interpret that is an archaeologist nightmare. And because it's another archaeologist, archaeologist nightmare because this was excavated in the 1920s and the absolute toss pot was excavating this in 1904, destroying all the layers. So again, two questions I can't rightly answer. I wish I could. Mm. Any, any other questions? Yes, please, yes. Oh. Go on, Ellen. Oh, sorry, yeah. If you've got doors in alignment, when you can see who's coming in and out, and two, it, it facilitates airflow through the building. The airflow is correct. You're not and talking if it was about... very costly, that might have been a big advantage. 
Air, airflow is correct, but when you're talking about people going in and out, um, this, these, this, the doorways do not align outside the building, right? Within so, the complex. So if you, so you'd have to have lights in all of the rooms to actually see who's coming in, in and out um, to get that sense. And, and there could be a lot more complications there um, in, in, in association with doorways and so on. But um, the, 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 the airflow would be important. Airflow is more important. Concentrate on the airflow more than anything. Airflow on those lower levels is more important than anything else. Uh, rather than being able to see who's coming in and out because the sense of alignment is making yourself vulnerable so um, whether you want to talk about um, seeing who's coming in and out the sense that you're already vulnerable because the fact that you got that door in the first place maybe counter maybe counteracts that and I do believe there's one more question and then we'll take a break whoever it is shout now <laughs> You, know, you said later on that the um, the women became subservient. Was that after the Western explorers had discovered them? No, Has no, 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 no. I, I, I think I think it's it's more of a. Um, you, you've heard about the the, the um, battle of the sexes. I think I, I think it is a battle of the sexes in the sense it, it's. Um, I, I think that I think the site is. I think the site that approached maturity. Um, and when when a site is approach approach maturity, um, the the sense of um, the sense of the male seems to take over. So obviously we've exhausted the landscape, we've taken all the resources, and now we need to survive. And now we need to kill people. Now we've got to take other people's resources. That's not that's not the thinking of a woman. Stereotypically, I, you could shout at me and say that's absolute nonsense. But stereotypically. If, if, you've got a, if you've got a female mindset, a female mindset is to uh, preserve life. A male mindset is to take life away. So what you see as the settlement starts to struggle in say about the, the later 1100s, 1200s, you start to have a male mindset taken over and that's probably what's happened. Is, could it be also be because the women used to be the gatherers of, from, the, from the forests and, and as they went, so the men took over because they went hunting. Is that where the change of? Uh, uh, no, that I I I I I I sort of um, eked in my head with that. That's not the civilization we're talking about. Um, the civil. This is a, not that type of civilization. That is the civilization of the of the other Native Americans who are who are the tree dwellers, which sounds terrible. Those are those uh, tree de dwellers of the Mohican. Though those are the people who understood the environment. That's where you've got. Um, uh, um, a matriarchal or a patriarchal system depending on where you're going but the fact of the matter is uh, this is a society that's very different and there's lots of things that we don't understand about it so it's not as you described Andrea um, if there's no nothing okay. any, anyone want to say anything else they have to do now because we've got to go on a break nope okay break Come time on. I'll go on quickly uh, uh, yeah, yeah it, it looks uh... Was the was the was the landscape there? Were the people there? Were they were they passive or aggressive people? Were they fight? Because it doesn't look very sort of uh, fortified. The town. Uh, I would say passive aggressive because um, now I, I this this is a point I always make right, and it's an obvious point. If these people were fighting other people all the time, they would never have built this right. That's fact one. Uh, secondly. Um, if they were fighting people all the time, they wouldn't have been able to trade, leading to the fact that they wouldn't have been able to build this in the first place. So when I say passive aggressive, obviously they're very much into, you know, what they've got. They're very, um, they're very um, materialistic in what they've got. Um, but, um, and then, then the aggressive bit comes in, leading to males dominating society. Does that answer your question? think so yep right let's break i want a break i need a break thank you it's, it's sue she does my edit <laughs> uh, i'm gonna I, i'm gonna put my mic on now so i can talk to myself Um, 
and recording now. So, um, so we what we what we said about Pueblo Benito. We haven't given any key dates. We know from the from the dendrochronology, which is quite clear with the site. We know from a bit of carbon radiocarbon dating. Uh, that we've got a time span of around 8.28 to 11.26, which means nothing to anybody. But it does mean something to somebody when you think about that's 300 years of continuous occupation. Now, um, when we're talking about the work in the 1920s, that cliff was still there. Um, I was a bit sketchy on the date when that cliff behind collapsed, which our Pueblo Benito people were aware. It collapsed... Um, not in the 1920s, it collapsed on January 1941, then it was known as the Threatening Rock. And the Threatening Rock collapsed, um, destroying lots of the archaeology that the archaeologists are living excavated in the 1920s. So obviously when they went back, they had to sort of um, reconsolidate some of the walls. But the walls that they were aware of um, were about 30 meters in height in that section, 30 meters. That's, that's taller than most churches, that, that's phenomenally high. This, this structure would be seen um, from many miles around. I'm aware that um, you may have lost some of that there, so I'll say it again. Many walls of the structure could be seen from many miles around. Uh, and it's also said that, for example, that um, at um, when they've estimated how high the external wall was, which all the other walls were attached to, it's likely that 30 tons of rock were actually used. Um, not 30 tons, start again, 30,000 tons of rock being used just on that one single wall that went around the whole thing alone. That's 30,000 tons. That's a lot of stone. Um, and when Keith was talking about the archaeological evidence, you know, um, we mentioned about what had been found. Well, some of the material found in the sort of rubbish tips and so on were some of those, um, were some of those, that pottery that we've shown you images of um, and that pottery that we've shown you images of being excavated in 2009, working out the cocoa and the traces of that cocoa stretch all the way, all the way back 1,200 miles towards the south. Um, and this is all before the Spaniards. This is all before the, the Spaniards changed the landscape with their diseases and their control and all the rest of it. But people had already left Pueblo Benito before that point. Um, and obviously we're looking, we've already mentioned about the excavations in 1904, but there were some, some tentative excavations in 1896 and 1900, where they found a room that was full of wooden flutes. Um, and I do believe we've got an image of a wooden flute um, towards the end of this lecture today. Um, and what they found, they, in those excavations in the, in the 1896-1900, they, they, they found some of the other things that haven't been found since, because lots of it was being sold off in 1904. Lots of those human effigies, lots of incense burners, lots of burners, and so on and so on. It's said, here's a whopping, here's a whopping statistic, right? that from all the estimations that they can work out, the five story high structures that are all integrated, all that stonework is all integrated. It all works as ties um, in regards to any movement. So if there were any earth tremors, it would have stayed up. 800 rooms within that complex, 800 rooms. Um, and it's basically, it's basically saying that, um, that based on estimates of those 800 rooms, um, and I don't know where they're getting these figures from, and I'm going to probably chuck this out there and probably disagree with it. It's likely that if, if there were up to about 12 sets of individual families over those 800 rooms, which sounds a bit low to me, but if that's correct, each of those households of people, um, about 70 to 100 people, giving you a roundabout population within Pueblo Benito of around a thousand people. That could be up or down, and I don't know where they get those figures from. Um, now, we also, one thing that we need to look at is another tiny bit of evidence. You may ask, um, and Chris asked, how do we know the landscape was covered in trees? Well, we know the landscape was covered in trees because lots of the evidence within the buildings uh, we can understand that they, um, it's from a type of pine known as a ponderosa pine that can grow for a very long length of time uh, that, um, that needs um, 
obviously, like all trees, needs moisture to survive, but can survive in semi-arid conditions, and the entire landscape would have been decked with it. You know, the entire um, canyon, Chaco Canyon, would have been full of these trees. And we also know that because external excavations from rat middens um, within the depths of those rat middens, dating way back over a thousand years, there's lots of evidence of um, the, the, the fine uh, pine leaves associated with the ponderosa pine. There's lots of evidence of the nuts and all the rest of it in those pat rat middens. So it's thanks to that that we're understanding that the entire land, it's saying in this, in this note, in, in fact, the scientists have hypothesized a thousand years ago plus um, the valley was completely cleared of almost all its trees. A thousand years ago was completely cleared of all its trees. So that landscape that you're talking about is nothing like the landscape that you see today. Over 300 years, it was so deforested as we see with the, with the tree rings that, we, that me and Goff examined earlier on, uh, that this had a dramatic effect not only on the civilization, but on its, on its demography, demography, its economic uh, pro productivity, and its ability to function. Um, since um, 2004, 2009 and onwards, they've excavated over 300,000 artifacts, giving you a really good indication of what the, um, what the landscape was like, what they ate, the, the various different types of animals that they ate, uh, the stone fragments telling you about different storage and so on and so on, obviously going back to the cocoa. Um, and one little thing that I mentioned that I just, just probably rushing this little bit because I really want to get back to the images. One thing, one thing that they did anal analyze a little bit about the DNA stuff. Um, it said that um, they analyzed nine, um, nine individuals um, that were buried in, in a certain structure. And these nine individuals buried in one of the buildings known as Room 33 um, showed the following, that um, lots of the individuals were buried with these turquoise and shell beads and pendants. Uh, one individual showed signs of being buried after a violent death, and maybe as Mrs. Uh, um, bludgeoned him to death. Um, it's saying that in that one room that they're examining over around a 300 year period, um, 13 people in that one room were buried. Um, only 13, but we're not sure what that says, buried underneath the floor level of the lowest levels of that one building, room 33. Um, and they're buried with lots of artifacts. And archaeologists go on to a tangent and say, you know, these must have been very special people in the group because naturally over 300 years, there'd be a lot more people buried there. And it's saying that the analysis found associated with nine of these individuals, the mitochondrial DNA, meaning they were all related through the female line. Archaeologists have concluded that Pablo Benito was associated with a feminine dominated, um, feminine dominated um, hierarchy. Um, and status in the early stages was inherited through the mothers. And then everything changed. Back to that question we, we had earlier on, everything changed. And then suddenly, um, overnight, the civilization disappeared. And here's another silly little fact. I love archaeologists saying this, right? The archaeologists, one archaeologist estimates um, that it took 805,000 man hours and female hours to complete the main structures at Pueblo Benito. What I should have said, 805,001 man hours, which would be more closer to the evidence. I just said that just to wind Ellen up. Right, so what we need to do, I love winding little Ellen up. You know, Ellen can join me next week in the lecture, so there you go. Because I, I miss my Ellen and my conversations. And by the way, Ellen, before you mention it, I do actually have a, a, something that arrived this morning. Um... So I, there was a joke there, but I'm not going to lower the tone. So um, this is what we're talking about. This is the evidence at uh, Mesa Verde. Um, this is the evidence of access from above. And you can get an idea of how I was describing. You know, you know that earlier image I was saying about really heavy timber beams going across? And they're the lighter timber beams um, going across from gable side to gable side. That's what we're talking about with the reconstruction there. 
uh, a nice little bit of a wooden ladder down. But this is the archaeological evidence that we get from other sites, not exactly Pablo Benito, because lots of that evidence has been lost through earlier excavations that haven't allowed the timber to actually survive, sadly. Um, and interesting little hole there. Um, and I'm not sure what they're trying to um, show there. But what we do have, we have a light rendering on the walls where we actually see a more heavy rendering on the other walls that we're actually seeing. But Chris, doesn't that look actually pretty snug? Yeah, a bit claustrophobic without windows. <laughs> but I got, I got to be honest with you, we're used to windows. That, that's, that's the point. We're used to living in a society mm. with windows. If you lived it within the Neolithic society of Scara Bray, you would not be used to windows there either. Yeah. Um, so you know, but do you know the the point I actually made earlier on. Do you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna figure with my artwork now. Oh, look at that there. Uh, oh, hang on, I missed I missed the get back to the other image. I got a bit too excited. Um, so here we go, my my artwork again. Let's bring in my artwork. So here we go. Can you the the point made earlier on? This was not a defensive structure. There you can see the doorways directly leading in from the outside wall. There's no way you're going to, there's no way you're going to be able to defend this. It's impossible. Even though the walls are extremely high, um, this is, this is all to do with um, heat management. Um, and if you, if I want to sort of really go off within your Canyon, there was a great river that once flowed a thousand years ago. And because of the uh, then lack of trees, within this entire landscape, there would have been less moisture, even though, you know, ponderosa pines would have sapped up lots of moisture from the ground. Because it's actually a woodland, there would be a lot of condensation, there'd be a lot more water available, a lot more moisture, creating the pattern of a river, creating that pattern of water storage and so on and so on. With all that gone, the river uh, basically dried up. And actually, before the end, we're gonna be looking at that one, the Great Kiva. moving on and you can say anything at any point chris because you know you are the one in charge oh am i <laughs> i get the whip <laughs> right okay i i i didn't really call for that one um <laughs> anyway because you can obviously see the really thick beams so these are um these are the really thick beams um that are running from the eve wall to the eve wall um and this is obviously leading to another part of the building the doorways don't need to be in, in any set place and obviously the light streaming through there but the light streaming through there today not in the past um obviously a grinding stone there another nice bit of, of evidence um they're grinding probably in the lower levels back to the earlier plan that we mentioned earlier on and obviously the other back to the reconstruction you've got the other cross lattice coming in there as well and really you can see that um we've really got if we sort of a straight line put a bit of a plumb bob on there um uh, that's fairly straight line there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, these people knew their angles. Um, again, next slide. And do you know what? Um, this is an image from 1920. Um, and you, um, when, I, when we think about um, earlier images, um, it's, it's almost as if these are ghostly images. But even today, much of what you can see is still there today. Uh, but with that collapse in 1941, January 1941, lots, lots of the evidence was lost um, with, with, the, with the taller stories. Looking from the outside again, looking from the outside again, if we, if we want to do a little bit more drawing, you know, you can see all these little entranceways. But there is one interesting thing when you look at this man. Um, the level of the doorways are quite low. It's not because mm. the people in the past were little people. Um, it's simply because um, this is again about um, heat uh, retention, um, particularly in the night. You're talking about very hot in the day, but it's going to be very cold at night. And the, the other thing as well is, if you look at sort of uh, any of those buildings from those country and Western, um, country and Western films, those Western films, um, you always see within those structures built by the, the Spanish that the beams seem to jettison outside. Very similar to the way the people were building at Pablo Benito. And from the, so you've obviously got um, connection a bit off a minute. 
bear with me a sec. Right, back again. Uh, obviously, you've got the, um, if we want to draw in, so we've got the first floor there. Um, and then we've got probably another floor there. And we've got another floor there. I that's going to, I think that's going to align up with that. So you've got ground floor, first floor, second floor. So you can imagine that's what it looks like. That, that's just the three floors. This, this must have been hugely, massively impressive. And the archaeological evidence tells us that, that it was that height from the stone that's actually been seen lying around those hundreds of tons of material they removed, taken away our archaeological information, alas. Carl, the, the stone looks as though it's dressed. Would, would they, did they ever find any tools that, you know, did they use the obsidian to cut the stone? How did they, or was it just the way the rock broke? Um, the answer is both. Um, right. and, and, and the reason why I'm saying the answer is both, when we look at Brock-like structures in Scotland, they're built dry stone. This is, this is mortar built. Again, you're not going to get this height unless it's mortar built. And you're rendering on the inside and outside, and you've got the beams, and there's a structural innovation that I'll be showing you in a short while. Um, th this is sandstone, so it, so it uh, lifts in lids, so you can have a quarry and you just... Right. Um, lift it up but yeah. there's going to be need some dressing to actually get that flush edge otherwise it's going to be really jagged and the the, the render is going to be everywhere so the answer is yes and the tools that they are using is obsidian because it, obsidian is extremely sharp and those that are involved in um who have ever been involved in the optical industry will know that there has been experimental um there have been exper experiments being used uh, using obsidian um, and flint to actually cut into uh, the, 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 the pupil if you, of your eye if you need that type of level of surgery because it's so sharp and it's so precise, much more sharper and precise than iron. So the answer is yes. So you're going to be using those tools. Now, I love this bird. This is a macaw. These, these, would, have, these would have sung quite happily in the trees and, at, at, um, and would have uh, flown in the trees around this landscape Without their trees, the, the, these animals would have become very, relatively extinct. Ba basically an overburdened parrot. Now, there is one interesting piece of evidence with this, that this hasn't been butchered. They're not eating this beast. Um, the usual signs for a butchered animal is actually, you can see signs that the animal's been butchered. And secondly, you, all, you usually take the, the head off as well. So it's likely that these were used as family pets within the buildings. And we've got lots of evidence of these, of these wonderful birds living alongside human beings. So at least they respected one thing. Um, and that's, that's basically a measure in the background from the 1920s. That's not something that they found there. The reason why I'm showing you this image of a, of a Spanish light church from about 400 years ago is that this isn't, this isn't a huge story church much of what would have been uh, built by the Spanish 400 years ago if it was more than um, a first story building would have collapsed. Where the, these buildings of Pueblo Benito were built in a far greater degree of engineering than anything the Spanish built a bit later. Looking into all these rooms, looking again into the landscape, much more of the same but again another angle um, obviously showing you the context of these buildings and there you go. Now this is this is giving you um, this is not a building that's been um, re reconstructed like one or two of the others that are associated with the collapse side within 1941. So what we have done, uh, we've done this building to death, but not completely. So obviously we know all this. We, we, we know these. We know the beams. We've even spoken about this doorway. But again, on the upper level, another doorway. On another level, another doorway. The interesting thing with this doorway is it's actually been, the height has been lowered. So in other words, they filled in the lower part of it. So I think that's to do with heat management into the, the first floor level. Um, and I think they've done a similar with that as well into the second floor level. Um, and what else have we got? What's happening is in the um, first floor level again, you can see that they're using corbelin because the material they've got to build with um, isn't the thick timbers that they're using in the lower levels. And this is a typical sign of deforestation. We see this at uh, places, like, um, in, in places like Orkney when they're building their burial chambers. They use corbelin 
because they can't roof the spaces over. So this is this is um, slight corbeling where they bring in the mace, they, they set the masonry slightly out so you can rest, rest timber on it. Moving on. Again, another image. Um, and more of those artifacts. Unfortunately, lots of what you can see here, uh, this is, these are images of some of the artifacts excavated in 1920, obviously distributed. The thing that they couldn't do in the 1920s, um, check for samples of um, lipids or check for samples of cocoa or check for um, samples of um, making local ale or anything. All that stuff went, but now they get now evidence in the samples that they've excavated in 2009. And that there is one of those monochrome um, examples that we've seen earlier on. Now, what do we have here? What we do have, we've actually got one of their flutes. Um, and you can see a little nick in there for the flutes. Uh, you can see one of the monochrome beakers with a handle. You can see something that's almost been slightly distorted by heat. So you've got three objects you're telling you about the culture. Objects that we've actually been talking about. Again, again, I will state it over and ago again. This is, this is like, this type of pottery is like a basic form of um, um, Asiatic uh, ware from, um, from ancient Greece or the type of pottery that you see from um, something like the Minoan civilization or something that you might see from the Incan civilization. This is a typical type of pottery the civilizations get to producing in their minds and actually in the physicality. There he is, a Macau. Obviously, they revered these beasts, but obviously, when they died, obviously plucking them to sort of for some plumage. But we don't actually get evidence of that either. There's one, um, and it's unusual. One of the things that I keep saying is that we do so many lectures based on the humans' time signs from the past. We don't actually mention the um, animals enough, and obviously, mentioning that um, mule that being killed on those spikes at Teutonburg last week is sort of a bit more of that flow. So again, another looking down on, on these buildings from the rock face. Again, lots of evidence tells us of people being buried with large amounts of turquoise. They're, they're, they're still mining it um, very nearby today. Uh, and obviously these turquoise beads, um, this, is, this is almost status, this is almost a trade item, but these are obviously being traded much further south. And this is one of those kivas. Um, now, when we look at a building like this and it would be naive of me to presume I know what I'm looking at. I could presume I know what I'm talking about. Um, but Chris, when I presented you with this image, what is this saying to you? It would have had a roof over it, um, a, a ladder leading from the roof into it, and also maybe a little bit of an entrance way leading down into it as well. What is this saying to you as an enclosed space? Don't say claustrophobia. <laughs> it's pretty big because, you, and, you know, the amount of people that you could actually get in there going by the seating around the edge would be quite large. Yes. Um, I wonder if that passage um, that goes in on the floor there comes actually directly from the from the houses where they live, or you know, they could go underground to it. I don't know. That with some of the kivas, you do actually have external access like this. So yes, um, and one strange thing is, is that these, hang on, the these around the side. So let's get my little drawing in there again. These around the side are little niches. They got backing to them. Um, and do you know what? Right. I am reminded again of everything that I've said with the Incan civilization, thousands of miles south. Maybe one or two um, remains of your ancestors were placed in there. But again, we don't have the archaeological evidence because none of these have been excavated with modern science, which is a bit of a shame. Um, and these here are not actually classed as fires. What are these things? Uh, are, again, we don't know. It's very, we, we don't have the full picture because we've got, we don't have these people writing. That's the, you know, it would be great if there was one or two texts for these people. We don't have writing, but they have an oral tradition. 
But in an oral, oral tradition, geometry doesn't work. You know, if you're trying to, you know what it's like trying to explain mathematics to me or trying to explain mathematics to my, my stepchildren or my children is really difficult without a bit of paper, right? So maybe I'm thinking that they may have actually had forms of writing, um, but none of that has, alas, survived. Now, this is, a, um, this is another um, kiva. Um, now, what it's saying with this kiva is slightly unusual, something opposed to what I've said. The, the, it's saying with the other one, if we can go back to the other one again, with these, it's not indicating that any of these are fire pits, right? But the central one on the other illustration is classed as a firebox, but the other two are classed as vaults. Um, now, whoever come up with the idea that these are seating pits, I would go with these being benches and niches and maybe one or two antechambers and various other things. But again, we can't get to grips with what is going on. However, the clue is, is these, these are meeting places. These are meeting halls. Um, and... When we look at somewhere like um, the Brock of Gurness or on the Orkney Islands or, or the Brock of Rousey, um, what, we, what archaeologists have been saying is that the, the Brock-like structures are community centres because all the Brock-like structures are surrounded by houses, which again has a wall around them, which has a ditch around the outside. But that's in, the, that's in our Western terminology. Is a similar thing going on that these are community buildings? I believe they are. They're big enough. It's more of a communal effort. Um, and, and this is what we're more seeing more than anything else. Um, and what they've done here at another site, they've created a small ritualistic kiva. Um, and again, this is a, this is a reconstruction. Um, and you've got a nice little ladder leading down there. Um, the sun from above. Is it meant to shine in these niches? Like we see in the Indiana Jones film and the crystal skull that light used. Um, again, it's about interpretation, but it's not all about interpretation because we know lots about what's going on with the environment, with, with, with the wood, trying to understand the niches and so on and so on and access into these buildings. So we do know some things. And actually, this is the last image. And the reason why this is the last image, it shows you a technological innovation um, that in the Western world, um, around this same time, we would have died for. And what is that technical innovation, Chris? Don't worry if you can't do it, but is it, is it obvious from what I'm seeing? What's the technical um, innovation? Give it to us. Is it building a doorway on, across a, a corner of a room? You know what? You get you, you, you yeah. Do, 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 do you know what? I'm so excited you got that because you get a hand clap, <laughs> right? And the reason why I'm so excited with that, you're the first person to get that. Um, now, the reason why the reason why I got so excited with this is that um, building a structure like this, you need strength, right? And you need load bore, You need something to load bear, right? Now, interestingly enough. Um, lots of these um, are either stone lintels or wooden lintels or however they're created. Um, these actually load bear. These carry the corner of the strength of the building on this. In the Western world, to load bear, we're having to create an arch. But for whatever reason, they come up with this innovation. And actually, you do see it on later castles. If you go to one or two later castles, you see you, you sort of go into a square bit of a building and it sort of goes off into the corner. That's to load bear the tower. So these, this is a techni technical innovation that these people have come across 1,200 years ago. Um, and that's exactly what I was looking for. That, that, that sense of engineering at its height. That's engineering at its best. You don't see arches with these buildings, so you don't need them. They come up with this, this, they come up with this innovation so that they could keep building up and up and up and up the multi-story sense of building the building. Um, and then finally, you've got in the, this is obviously the lower level, and you know it's the lower level because you've got the big beams and so on and so on. Um, and then what you then have is up here, you've got this little bit of a corbelling, 
Um, so I'm going to do a little bit more drawing. This is set slightly back, right? And this is set slightly back. And then you have these split timbers um, because they're actually running out of wood. Now I'm told that when you start using split timbers, you lose half of the strength in the wood. Um, if you use whole sections of um, whole tree stumps, you keep the strength um, in the wood itself if, if you keep them integral. Um, so later on, things are starting to get worse and things are starting to decay. And also you've got there another doorway into another room. Um, on that note, Chris, um, is there anything you would like to say before I open the mics and all hell is broken loose. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, then, uh, word of warning again, if nobody wants to show their image on this next bit, they have to um, cut their image because this is still recording. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna stop screen sharing on three, two, one. Um, what we're gonna do, um, uh, you're all vain. <laughs> uh, we're gonna unmute everybody, so... Um, Okay, what we're going to do, we're going to start in order. Um, and Pam, for some strategic, oh, Pam's there. I've got to hear Pam's voice in a moment. Um, Keith, um, anything you would like to add to today's lecture? Uh, uh, is there a, what is the relationship between these people and the Anastasi? They're, they're, they're basically the same type of people. Um, the, the, so they're the, living at the same time. Yeah, they're, they're similar similar time span. When we look at Mesa, when we look at Mesa Verde and we look at other peoples, we will have more of a link and we'll have more of an understanding. The main thing is stop thinking about the Anastasi. Think about the fact that the, the populations just disappeared. They just went. Um, but obviously, there's a difference in time span, um, and we will we will examine that question again. We'll we'll, we'll keep that one um, for a later date. Um, Chris, uh, Karen, what about you? Um, no, nothing to add. That was very interesting. Yeah, enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Barbara? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> Sue. <laughs> Sue. Uh, did, did they have chimneys? Was there any... Uh, I'm just thinking about their fire no. pit. No, 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 no. There's no evidence of chimneys. Basically, this, this is another thing. So if you want to, if you want to look on the innovations, right? Um, innovations in the West, the staircase, right? So when you get basic cultures, you don't have stairwells. But that's not fair with these people. They don't have stairwells, but they have technical innovation. So that's not fair. Fires are another thing. When you start to have fireplaces set into a wall, that's another technical innovation. They haven't got that. So it's likely on the, it's likely on the highest le levels um, somehow they're not setting light to their buildings, or if you're building low if you're burning low combustible materials, back to what Ellen said earlier on, um, those doorways act as ventilation, but you couldn't have too many fires burning at any one time. There's not any ventilation in these buildings. Um, mm. Ellen, Ellen wants to come in on that one. Ellen. No, I'm fine. Good. There's no teeth today, that's why. Jane. Um, because I came in late, I wasn't sure quite where this was. Is it North America? North America, you've got New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Arizona. Okay. Um, Jim? In those communal buildings, those round buildings, if you had a lot of people there, um, would you have somewhere for them to go to the loo if they saw a cool show? <laughs> Do you know? Do you know what we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna come on to that one um, after everyone's asked the questions, and there's more of a practical thing which we're gonna discuss. Rosamond. Um, no, that was all new to me. So a very interesting lecture. Thanks, Carl. What about Andrea? We're still doing the toilets, Andrea. Yeah, no? I just thought it was fascinating. I never realised there was um, that kind of culture there. Definitely. Um, Goff. Oh, anything, yeah, Goff? Yeah. Great, very interesting indeed. And it's definitely on my bucket list when I'm unlocked. Um, <laughs> and and um, Pam, I, I've, got, I've got to do the toilet question in a moment. So have you got anything? Only, um, where you said about the split timbers, it's only recent years that people realised if they turn them up the other way, you would still have your strength. But because you laid them flat, you haven't. 
yeah nice oh. nice as as in as in log cabins um you you keep the log um yes um and obviously if you split them you've got to use the, the strength the other way around than what they've been doing exactly um yeah. now do you know do you know what right um i i woke up this morning and i thought um what what could they have used as fuel um after they had um mm. cut down all the trees now i used something else in my mindset um we've got a bit, bit of a miss of connection a minute hang on right i used something else because it's so dry the environment's so dry you could dry out um the animal and human waste um mm. and then you could burn it um it would burn at a higher temperature um than peat for example so peat burns are about two three hundred degrees c I, I i think human um human and animal waste would burn at a higher temperature um and actually i think it would give you um a decent fuel um and in other words, I think the answer is because we don't have, we, we don't really have evidence of cesspits and so on. It may indicate that that was dried out and used as fuel. Everyone's gobsmacked. Um, right. So um, that was, a, I, I felt that that lecture worked really well. Um, I'm looking forward to next week. If I go off piche next week, it's because um, I don't have enough evidence for the archaeology of the English Armada, but I'm going to give it a good old shoot. Um, hopefully see any of you, um, um, obviously, over the, over the next few days. And I'll be hopefully seeing you all next Thursday. Uh, Ellen, I did get an envelope this morning. Thank you very much. Um, ha um, have you all, en all enjoyed today? Yes. yes. Thank you. Rubbish. Rubbish. Right. <laughs> if anyone wants to chat afterwards, then they may do so and have a quick chat with me. They're, they're welcome. If not... Um, I will see you all very, very soon. I'm going to say goodbye to Keith, Karen, Jane, Goff, Andrea, Pam, Jim, Rosamond, Barbara, Ellen, and Chris. Uh, and Sue, you need to change the name on that. See you guys. Bye, bye all. Bye. 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 Hi. Bye bye. Bye bye, boy. See you, Jimmy. Oh yeah. Oh. oh. Cases. Bookcases. When do you want them? Uh, right. So you and I have got to meet, don't we? Sometime. <laughs> Sometime. Yeah. Uh, I can, I've sold things on eBay, and I put the thing outside our house, and a person's walked up to it, collected it, and walked off with it. <laughs> and we oh. stood about a yard away. Um, well, how big are these bookshelves? Um, um, one is about um, six foot high by about five foot wide. They're black. I mean, it's not posh. They're just black. They're black, and they come together with um, what do they call it? Um, those round things, you know, with the um, attachments on that you sort of turn and they screw together. Ah, uh, right, yeah, I know. Um, are you able to get them to Barry, or what are you asking me to do? Um, I, th I think they might just about fit in my car, if I put the front seat down, maybe. Um, right. There's a couple of smaller ones, but this bigger black one, I've taken it to pieces, and uh, I'll give you, you probably work out how it goes back together, but um, I probably could get it in my car just about, but then I don't know what what you do then right okay so i tell i tell you what if i um if if i keep it sensible um and say i can do i can do say sunday okay so i'll write it down sunday yeah um and we'll do sunday and i'll do yeah i'll have to, i'll have to enter you onto a post-it note <laughs> what do you want me to bring it to um the uh, cannon street studio if, you, if you're able to that would be a great help so i'd be i'd be i'll have my barry day then oh okay but you need to let me know what you can do yeah yeah okay i think that'll be okay yeah i, I don't actually I don't accidentally stuff your missus in the car because i couldn't handle her there'd be no room for her in the car <laughs> she'll sit on the roof <laughs>
that, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's a good thing then, isn't it? Um, <laughs> all right then. Look, okay then. What I'll do, I'll um, yeah, I'll, 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 it'll be if I could say Sunday um, at say about um, Sunday at say eight o'clock or something. Yeah. Is that morning or evening? Um, eight o'clock in the evening when it's cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> and there's less no, cars. There's less Best cars, cars on the road. And the thing is, if you go yeah, early, groups. if you go earlier to Barry, and there's there's traffic queuing over to Barry Island, and they're turning around the traffic, you're you're going to have a nightmare. And I don't think you probably you might be stopped coming to Barry from Lantwit, um on Sunday earlier on in the day as well. Oh, that's true. Oh, that's fine. That's okay. Yep. No problem. Okay. Do you want me to confirm it closer to the time, or yes, just send send me send me a text is better because um, sometimes things get lost in communication. All right, then. yeah, no problems. Did will do. Do you want still want that um, Egyptian picture? It's always useful on the wall. Anything to do with Egypt. Um, <laughs> is, is that the is that the Hatshepsut one? Um, no, it's uh, the one of the profile of. Um, uh, what's, her, what's her name? Um, Cleopatra, the big, ah, right. big one. She, she, she was quite small, actually. <laughs> Not on this picture, she wasn't. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair I enough. think it's I'm sure it's Cleopatra. Um, where have I done with it? Oh, did you want a quick look? I can show oh, you. Oh no, now. You, you, you sent me an image. It's fine. Oh, that's okay. Now the other one was on the other picture I had. I was asking for the hieroglyphics. That was a hand painted in Egypt on papyrus paper but I couldn't work out the name so I think somebody had it made with their name on it but I couldn't work out what it was but I've um I've got it on eBay at the moment oh brilliant <laughs> if I don't sell it <laughs> if, you don't, if I don't sell it we'd be interested <laughs> you'll probably sell it you'll probably sell it yeah. uh, probably. <laughs> It's just okay. the other one's a bit big and I couldn't post it to anybody because it's no. so big and heavy. No. But it looked nice on your wall. Look nice on your on the wall in your office, definitely. Oh yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. That'd be good. Okie doke then. It all it all keeps in with the theme. Okay definitely. then. Br brilliant. Anyway, thanks for all that. That's okay, no problem. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, hi I'm gonna hide in a cold corner. <laughs> From Michelle. <laughs> oh no, she's in. She's 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 in the Royal Mint at this minute. So yeah. Uh, has she left you a list of things that she wants done? <laughs> no, she can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Say hello to the goats. <laughs> yeah, I will, I will. I will. I will. I will. I will. We'll have to get them on. We'll have to get them on next week. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> so, Thank uh, you, okay, then. See I'll you see you soon. soon. Take care. Bye. See you soon. Bye. See you Sunday. Bye-bye. 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 Yep. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.